I think today's update is slightly less strong on the Pacific trough and slightly stronger toward actually having Greenland high develop a bit later on, which I think is in, is is com, is consistent with the model having a weaker vortex. Yeah, I'm fairly certain that if I were to subset those regime members by the vortex, that the Greenland high members would be the ones at the lower end of the at the weaker end of the vortex spectrum systematically. And so you do see that storyline then. It's like if the vortex weakens, then that transition occurs. Yeah, it looks like for the rest of the month, though, it should be a Pacific trough. It's just going into January is the big question, I think, right? Yeah, and I think it, it would always be a big question, but I think it's quite nice that we sort of have, it looks like it's a question of two. Is it Pacific trough or is it is it more Greenland high? It doesn't look as quite well distributed across all four or five if you include no regime. The, the only interesting thing that comes from this is that whilst the Pacific trough is the regime that's most widely associated with above average temperatures across North America, it's not actually the warmest regime for the East Coast. The warmest regime for the East Coast is Pacific Ridge because it's right. associated with that ridge in the Southeast. And that's more what we saw in something like December of 2021 when it was just unusually mild um, in December for the, for the Eastern half. Uh, and and so whilst everybody's been fixating on this Pacific trough as this big kind of you look at the temperature at normally maps of North America and it's just above average everywhere. Actually, it's not the it, for the east. It's not the worst it could be. It's just that it's kind of systematically not very good for anyone in terms of winter weather prospects. Yeah, I think in the east, the Pacific trough pattern usually leads to lots of clouds and rainfall, which would kind of mitigate the warmer temperatures. But it doesn't necessarily bring snow. I've noticed that I did some research for our area, and our biggest snowstorms come from a change a change in the pattern from the Pacific trough to the Greenland high, because you get that moisture, but then you also get the cold air that's locked in. Interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd like to look at this more in terms of the localized snow effects. Yeah. yeah I think that's an interesting, <laughs> interesting aspect now that we've got this nice set. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for for adding that on your website. And then I'd also like the um, the graphs below that show all the different ensemble members and you know what they're showing in terms of uh, the probabilities and the um, ensemble means. So it's a nice graphical presentation um, for for folks who well meteorologists to see. Um, thank you. Yeah, no, it 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 was uh, it's a bit convoluted the way it ends up on that website because it actually runs on a Columbia computer and then is sent via FTP to the web server. So it's a, it's a little convoluted, but it seems to be running quite reliably, which is quite nice. I actually, since I published it, I haven't had to go and redo anything. The, the most unreliable part in that chain is actually the NSEP data server that it gets the data from. That's the one that's least reliable. Oh. <laughs> So usually if it doesn't if it doesn't update, usually the reason is because it couldn't get one of the data files from NSEP and it's just timed out. Ah, uh, okay. I know that on the Euro page you can get the same North America weather regime forecasts, but it doesn't look as clean as the one on your page. Uh yeah, so what the, the Atlantic ones, right? Um for ECMWF? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not quite sure exactly what what uh, method goes into their regimes because they don't seem to, they seem to have terrible verification statistics. Oh when wow! Click back, but if you click back through the different the run to run variability just seems very large, and I've never really understood exactly what's going on with those forecasts, and I I don't quite understand what how they're defining some of the things they're defining. Okay, and um, maybe I'm being too critical. <laughs> I know in the, uh, well, you know, reverting back to the seasonal outlook, the CANSIPS forecast model showed completely warm across the entire country all the way through March, and then it pattern breaks down. It's really interesting to see all the different seasonal outlooks and how they're so different going forward. But like you said, there's a lot at stake here. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, Deutsche Wetterdienst, the German weather service, run a what well, they contribute a seasonal model to the Copernicus set. Um, and and their model doesn't have it doesn't have atmospheric initial condition uncertainty perturbations, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, so essentially, if you look at their forecast, it 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 just evolved entirely into a sudden warming by the end of December, 
because there was no spread. So basically, the ensemble mean uh, the ensemble mean was a sudden warming, and something like sixty percent of the members have a sudden warming at the end of December because there was just not not enough uncertainty growth. And so what's interesting from that is that the model is so extremely confident in a negative NAO in January because it's so extremely confident in a sudden warming. Whereas if you look at the Met Office prediction system, their model is initialized in a both in, it has initial condition uncertainty and they initialize it on different dates to do what's called a burst, uh, uh, not a burst, a lagged ensemble. Uh, so you get both your initial condition perturbations and you get inherent uncertainty from having initialized the model at different times. Now, what's unusual about their model is that it missed the weakened vortex that has thus far developed in December. So its model has an ensemble mean stronger vortex through most of December. And interestingly, that model has a much more positive NAO and a milder forecast for everyone in January. So I think this, it, it looks like the stratosphere is actually potentially a big player in January, given that if, across these models, you have one that's very confident in a weak vortex and one that's very confident in a strong, and they have exactly the opposite patterns at the surface, which is what you would expect if the stratosphere mattered. And so I think the 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 the, the evolution as we go into January really looks like it does depend on whether we persist in this weakened vortex, and maybe if we do hit a sudden warming, uh, which seems like the sweet spot for that is like the first two weeks of January. Yeah. But I wonder, even if the vortex weakens, it doesn't mean, mean the East Coast is going to see cold and snow, though. No. And and I mean, we saw that. I, I, I mean, I think it's the way that's best to think about it, it, at least in my mind, is that a negative NAO doesn't guarantee cold air and snow. Yeah. And the thing is, the stratospheric warming doesn't guarantee a negative NAO. Yeah. So even if it did couple down really nicely, you know, people have these mental images of, 2010 or some other winter where it was really cold and snowy and think that's what a sudden warming does and it's like that's really at the high end of the potential it, it, yeah. it's more of a, it, it is a shift in the distribution a shift in the probabilities but as we saw in february 2023 no it didn't happen yeah i think we need a negative eastern pacific oscillation and a positive pna for the east coast to get cold weather um, the nao usually i mean we it was negative the nao is negative for most of what late november into early december and it's been pretty mild i think for the east coast it depends on what happens in the pacific more than the atlantic that's kind of what i've seen yeah and that, that's probably why you know things like the alaskan ridge regime are so important for cold air outbreaks and yeah. in terms of cold you know that really is and i think it's it's almost like a bit of a false kind of equivalency. So for Europe, the, one of the most important weather patterns is the negative NAO because that's an upstream block. Right. And it, for an upstream block for here, it's the Alaskan Ridge. And so that yeah. gives you the, that kind of equivalence. And I think actually, you know, if you look at NDJFM as a whole, last winter had a pretty extremely negative NAO on the whole for that extended winter season. You wouldn't hit. You wouldn't have known it. There was no snow in New York City, and <laughs> um, so that just kind of goes to show why that's not a, a particularly useful diagnostic. Yeah, definitely an interesting.